Hello? Volume good? Too loud? Sounds good? All right. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. If I figure if I start now, we should be done at the normal time tonight with the length of this one. Father, again, Father God, once again, we just gather in your warm embrace, Lord. We thank you so much for your solidarity. We thank you that you pre preserved your word for us. We thank you for your son. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit who lives within us. Father God, we just ask your Holy Spirit to bring your word alive in, in us tonight, that you would just help every one of us have something stick before we go home, and just um, help us have a great evening this evening, Lord. And thank you that we're able to gather like this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I'm not going to try and talk light speed tonight. It's a, it should be a good length for this evening. We are finishing up the Pentateuch tonight. This is uh, covering Deuteronomy. As with the previous four books, this was written by Moses uh, in ancient Hebrew originally, uh, around 1452 B.C., and that is with a caveat. Uh, we don't know who wrote the last chapter because the last chapter is about the death of Moses, so obviously he couldn't write that himself. Uh, it is assumed that Joshua wrote it because he was the new, uh, essentially, commander-in-chief at that time, but it's not said anywhere that he was the one who wrote it, so it's just an assumption. The name of this book, uh, as with the previous book, it takes some of the words out of the first sentence when it's in the Hebrew. Uh, the verse actually begins with, these be the words which Moses spake, so Debarim, the words, is one of the names. There's actually four names for this in Hebrew. Kith, which means fifth, book of reproofs, and iteration of the law. Those are four commonly used names in the Hebrew for it. Of course, the version of the name that we know is the Greek version of the name, which is a compound word. It is the Greek word deutero, which is two, and uh, namion, which is law. And so when you read that literally, it actually means second law. Now, don't be confused with that. It doesn't mean that there's a first law and then this is an entirely new second law. That's actually not what it means by second. It actually means second as in like a copy. It's a copy of the first law. So that's actually what, what second law means here. So don't misunderstand what that term means. In fact, uh, another way to put it is it's a repetition of the law or a second giving of the law. It's still the same law. The high-level outline of this one um, is we are currently in the wilderness at 39 years and 11 months. That is the place in time where Israel is at. This is around 1451 B.C. The location where the plains of Moab, and this was literally just before crossing the Jordan into the Promised Land. That was the physical location. The style of Deuteronomy is primarily a, co a collection of three sermons given by Moses. So they're actually in that kind of style and format, like somebody preaching in front of you on Sunday Moses got up in front of the people and he reiterated the law to the people in three separate sermons. And then at the very end, uh, there's a few more conclusionary statements, and then of course 34 covers the death of Moses. Um, right, 30, uh, the end chapters are historical event review. The theme of this book is essentially a book of reminding and most importantly, preparation for the nation of Israel. They're about to cross the promised land. It's been 40 years in the wilderness, pretty much walking circles, so now they have a lot of work in front of them, and the Lord wants them pre uh, prepared and ready to go. A bit of trivia, the New Testament actually contains 53 direct quotes from Deuteronomy. So in other words, it's pretty heavily quoted, and in fact, it is the only book that Jesus quoted when confronting Satan. So moving into chapter 1, this is the first uh, sermon given by Moses. It starts right into it. And the text does mention that it was literally the 39th year and 11th month and first day. And uh, I think his age was given in there somewhere. That must be on a different page. So it was a sermon preaching style. It says in verse 5 that on this side of the Jordan in the land of Moab began Moses to declare this law. And the word declare there that I boldface, essentially that means to make plain, to explain, to dig, to engrave, hence a preaching style. Chapter 1, from a high level, it essentially recounts Numbers chapters 1 through 14. 
It's a reiteration of that location where God told them to possess the land. Again, this is an inheritance given to Israel by God. Moses needed help with the burden of leadership. Again, this is from uh, Numbers chapter 11. It's just a reminder. It mentions how Israel, in a majority, rejected the promised land once they got there. And the phrase I have there is, we are like grasshoppers. It is too strong for us. We can't do it. Even after everything God took them through, that was their response. And so it's a reminder, this is what happened. And then there's a recounting of the judgment that only Joshua and Caleb, and of course the children of all the rest of the people, would be able to enter in 40 years. So that's a kind of a reminder of this is how and why we're at where we're at right now. Moving into chapter 2, Moses then moves into recounting Numbers chapter 15 through 21. It's a recovering of that law. Again, this is high level. We're not going into the individual uh, specifics. Well, some of the things covered there, the Edom land was not to be taken. That's Esau's offering, uh, offspring. And in fact, while they were there, Israel was to even pay them for their food and water. The Moab land was also not to be taken because that's Lot's offspring. And just a reminder, Ruth was a Moabite and she is in the line of Christ. The Ammonite land was, also, was not to be taken because that is also Lot's offspring. One of the conquests that was done there was uh, Sihon, uh, the Amorite. And all they asked to do was pass through his land. That's all they asked. And he refused, and they, they had to conquer him because of his behavior. And this was a reminder by Moses given to the people in uh, chapter 2, verse 36, where he says, There was not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God delivered all unto us. A strong reminder of that. Chapter 3 recalls Numbers chapters 21 through 25, the law contained within there. It mentions the defeat of Og, who was the king of Bashan. And the, this is actually this location. So Sihon had been defeated, Og had been defeated, and this land of the Amorite and Bashan was given to Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh. So this is the section of land before crossing the Jordan. And as a reminder of that, um, you know, the other tribes were getting upset, thinking that they just wanted to say, we're done. But all of the fighting men continued with them to help the other tribes get their land. Um, but they were given that side of the Jordan before they crossed. Joshua was commissioned as the new leader, that is mentioned. Again, from a historical point of view, he's actually commi um, commissioned even once again further in Deuteronomy, but this is recounting what had happened previously. And Moses is just being very open with this sermon well, that he was given to the people. He recalls his plea with God to enter the promised land. He says in uh, chapter 3, verse 26, But the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. Let it suffice thee, speak no more to me unto this matter. A different way to say that was that Adonai was angry with me on the account of you, and he didn't listen to me. Adonai said, enough from you. Don't say another word to me about this matter. So remember that Moses had an extremely unique position with God, frankly, in biblical history. I mean, Moses is the only one who had that specific kind of relationship with God. It said that he spoke face to face with God. Um, as a reminder of that, you know, Moses' face even glowed with his encounter with God. Now, this concept face to face can confuse some people because there's another scripture. Uh, I didn't put it in here. It must be somewhere else. But essentially, God tells him, nobody can see my face and live. So then you hear Moses spoke to him face to face, and so you're going, oh, that's an error in the Bible that, you know, that, that conflicts. That doesn't make sense. The term face to face in the context that's being used right here, it actually means an honest and open communication with the Lord. So like he verbally spoke with the Lord, but it wasn't like literally he saw God's face. He could ask questions. He could be honest. He could intercede. Nobody else had that completely open relationship with God. Again, in biblical history. And so that's that concept of face-to-face. -face. It's not a literal face-to-face, -face, because we know scripturally, at one point, he was able to see, Moses said he wanted to see more of God. And God said, okay, and he showed him his backside, and God covered Moses with his hand in the cleft of a cliff so he wouldn't be destroyed by the sheer holiness of God. 
Uh, oh, right. Another aspect I wanted to point out here. So some people look at everything that Moses did just from a works point of view. And of course, you know, we're not God, but speaking purely as humans, we go, wow, Moses did all of that. And he made just one mistake and he can't go into the promised land. Well, one scripture I did want to bring up for that, and there's more than this. In James chapter 3, verse 1, it said, My brethren, be not as many masters, and that word master here actually means teacher you know, in the Greek, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation or judgment. So teachers, leaders, people in, in positions of power and authority, you're held to a tighter ship, if you will, and you're accounted for it. And I was going to say more here, but it got really long, and so I'm just going to kind of verbally summarize it. The concept where he struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to it, uh, a lot of people tried to relate it to essentially the giving water life of Jesus Christ, you know, the future Messiah that was coming. And instead, Moses got up there, and, and it said in the, in the scriptures that he was angry. Moses was openly angry in front of the congregation, and he hit that rock in anger, and everybody saw it. And that is not the picture of his son that Jesus was trying to, get to the pe give to the people. So it was a misrepresentation, again, of this shadow of his coming son. This is what was coming, the Messiah. Again, lot, I totally agree with the explanation there. Uh, I don't see it literally explained that way in the scriptures and the text, but it makes sense. Uh, it really does. Uh, I, didn't, I did include 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4 there, uh, where, I'm, where it mentions that Christ was the spiritual rock. And I actually did want to read that. I should have found that first. Now, what are the odds? I actually had a bookmark in 1 Corinthians. Okay, chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. More, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank from that spir spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So again, the part I love here, as a humble leader, Moses recounted his failure with the people. And I just remembered another thing that I meant to put down here. So verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 26 opens with, but the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes. Now think about the people. Moses is their leader. He's leading by example, right? What if Moses got a freebie for doing something he shouldn't have? They all got in trouble, burned, killed, plagued, death. It, wouldn't, it would not help the nation of Israel to see Moses get off when they're held to a different standard. So that's the phrase, for your sakes. Chapter 4 uh, is essentially a call to obedience. Moses is urging Israel to be obedient to the Lord, their God. In verse 2, it is, it is said, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. He goes on further, I don't have it here, but he reminds them of the Baal Peor and the idol worshippers' destruction, everything that happened there uh, with that time. Follows up with reminding them of the Ten Commandments. And essentially, don't be hypocritical. In chapter 4, verse 9, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Essentially, that concept of, you know, and he says in the New Testament scriptures, first take that uh, beam out of your own eye before you, you know, say something about your brethren. So again, right here, take heed to yourself and focus on yourself and then take what you know and pass it on. Moses reminded them, I already said this part, he reminded them of his failure. Not even the great Moses was excluded from God's law in full. And there was a prophetic warning should disobedience occur. And that prophetic warning was Israel scattered among the nations. And then after that, it mentions cities of refuge. Verse 
that is the end of the first sermon. Again, this is just a high-level survey outline kind of uh, covering. Sermon 2 starts in chapter 4, verse 44. Um, I think, I, yeah, I'm just going to start right in chapter 5, though. So Moses begins to remind Israel of their covenant with God at Mount Sinai, and it covers what was uh, discussed in Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. And here we have another very detailed review of the Ten Commandments. In fact, this location is so detailed and succinct, usually when people quote the Bible for the Ten Commandments, this is the one they use. Even though the Ten Commandments are in here in multiple different places, if you see them on like shirts or on walls or posters, this is usually the location referenced. And he reminds them, Israel, of their fear at Mount Sinai, and he concludes with, keep his commandments. You remember your fear, keep his commandments. Chapter 6 is a very important Old Testament chapter. It's really a cornerstone Old Testament chapter. A chapter. It's very significant. In verse 4, there is a great commandment, love the Lord your God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In Mark chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus is speaking. He answers him, The first of all the commandments is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So Jesus Christ quotes this verse in the New Testament. Now, to kind of break, break this down, the here, here this, this first word, here, is actually the word shema, the Hebrew word shema. And from a Jewish perspective, Israel perspective, this word is a core and foundation of the Israel faith as a nation. It is much more powerful than just the word here. I mean, it's like an essence of being this word. This, this is who you are. Hear this, the Lord our God is one God. The Lord here is the name Jehovah in the Hebrew. And this is the Jewish national name of God. Our God is actually the Hebrew word Elohim, which is a plural, and this is important, plural form of the supreme God. That is a critical aspect that it's plural. We're obviously talking Old Testament here. This is before Jesus has even come. And the whole Trinity concept, even in church history, didn't really get discussed and nailed down until the 4th century. So this three-person aspect of our God, he's still one God, but he's three persons. And so we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they're, all, and they're still one God. And that's why this verse and concept is so critical, and the words used in the original Hebrew are so critical because they're still doctrinally accurate because we have the word one God well if it's one how can there be three this word Elohim is a plural word and just to be clear there is a singular word that exists in Hebrew that could have been used if it really meant only one so that's why it's critical that Elohim was used here and the one Lord that is mentioned right after this this is uh I did not look up how to pronounce that one Echad It is actually a a compound unity, again, as opposed to a singular unity. So even this word has a plural aspect to it with just by sheer word definition. And this same word concept is used in the New Testament where Jesus himself says in John chapter 10, verses 30, I and my Father are one. There's a prophetic promise in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord, and his name one. So this concept is brought through the Old Testament in more than one scripture, and it is repeated by Jesus himself in the New Testament. This is a prophetic promise that's happening here way back in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 5 a uh, oh, very well-known verse, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all, thy, all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. This is repeated by Jesus in three of the Gospels. I have the locations there written down, Matthew chapter 22, Mark 12, and Luke 10. There is no place for any sort of doubting fear. Respectful fear in the Lord, absolutely, but not 
doubting, disbelieving fear, like the Lord can't do it. Two different types of fear. Yes, a lot. Do not fear. And, and we, haven't, we haven't even got there that far. Sorry, far, but in Joshua, do not fear is repeated a lot. Be strong and courageous. Verses 6 and 7, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and while thou walkest by the way, and while, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. I included this uh, just to kind of give some background from, again, an Israel point of view, because that's, that's the focus here. That's the group. This was very impactful in the Israel culture and even still is today in the Orthodox Jews. This is, this is part of their... Go ahead. These verses, and we're getting to some more verses that are, are critical. Correct. Yep. Correct. And so they literally entwine these verses with their very essence every day. And, that, and that's what I wanted to stress with, uh, with this particular chapter. It is really entwined with the nation of Israel. It is a lifestyle for them daily. In verse 8, it goes on to say, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. So I'm going to talk about this a little more in the Old Testament point of view before I do. At the time of Jesus, going forward, the Jewish spiritual leaders were openly practicing this verse by tying phylacteries to their forehead or their hand with leather strips. And a phylactery is actually a small box holding scriptural parchments. And the thing I wanted to stress out, from, stress from the New Testament, it says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 5, he says, Jesus says to these Jewish spiritual leaders, by all their works, they do for to be seen of men, and they make broad their phylacteries, in a sense, so everybody can see them, and they enlarge the borders of their garments. So while these concepts were important, the Jewish spiritual leaders were essentially bragging about them, and Jesus called them on it. And, you know, he flat said, this is false and boastful spirituality. But it started all the way back here in Deuteronomy. Go ahead. That's correct. It's called a mezuzah, um, and it is put in uh, the, the top of the door. And well, then, no, they have, they have to be. You have to be able to reach it. You have to be able to reach it. Yes. Okay. So I have it at the bottom of the page. So we're getting to that. No problem. But it's good you know it. So, so I'll, I'll just finish up this part right here first, and then we'll talk more about that. So. The mark of the beast is one of the things that's prophesied. And the reason I'm bringing this in now is we just talked about verse 8, where it talks about this sign upon your hand or on your forehead, right? We're talking about the Word of God here. The mark of the beast is a perversion of that. What is Satan? He just wants to always do the opposite of God in every way possible. In Revelation chapter 13, 16, and 17, this is prophesied. This is going to happen. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free or bond, in other words, everyone to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. That no man may buy or sell, save that he have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Satan trying to glorify him himself in a way that the Lord was supposed to be glorified. So verse 9 is where we get to the mezuzah part. It says, And they shall write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. So gates were actually a really big deal uh, in the Jewish culture because of Exodus. I mean, that was, to them, a physical salvation at the time. That, that angel passed over them because their gate was protected, and the Lord told them how to protect themselves for that event. So gates, huge deal. And Jesus even frequently used gates or entry words in his explanations. Now, the, this uh, mezuzah that you mentioned... This is, uh, it literally means door jam. 
And so that's why that's where they would put it. They would, it's a little box, and they would put it in the door jam. And this small box would be placed in the upper corner, but as you mentioned, it had to be where people could reach it. And within is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, and also chapter 11, verses 13 to 21. At least that's what my research told me. It might be some other ones, but all, I found multiple sources. It was those specific verses. And as people would enter the home, they would kiss their fingers and they would touch the name of God on the door jam where that masuza was. And the whole point of this wasn't to just be ritualistic. It was literally to reshow their devotion to God. Like I mentioned before, this was a way of life. This was an existence for them. This was them practicing their devotion to God on a daily basis. And that's why everybody entering your home, it was, it was just a constant reminder everywhere you went, you know, we're here to serve God. And so I just wanted to stress, this is not an idle sort of way. This is ultimately worship and claiming who is their Lord. The Jewish Shema is the oldest fixed prayer in the Jewish history. It's the oldest one they have. They have many more than that, but this is the oldest one. And the Shema itself, this is so different to the Mesuzah, the Shema actually has one more set of verses. So the Shema also contains the same as in the Mesuzah, but it has a third section from Numbers chapter 15, 37 to 41. And so essentially this prayer is speaking forth the words of Scripture. They don't add to it. So they, they literally just speak forth the Scripture. And as it says back in verses 6 and 7, you know, it said, um, when I do this, when you lie down and when you rise up. And so for that reason, this prayer is spoken once in the morning and once in the evening, every day. Yes, obviously prayers. Obvi obviously. This is, this is just the one. So one of the other things, um, I forget the name of it, but they have a book of prayers. And again, they're all scriptural, but essentially it is a collection of scriptures that they read on a regular basis. And the Shema, Shema is just one of them. So yes, plenty of other prayers in between. And it was part of, again, their daily life. So it was interspersed throughout the day as well. Um, there was also certain ones that they would do every time they would go into a synagogue. But even that, of course, we're in Old Testament now. That doesn't happen until right before the New Testament age where they have the synagogue concept. So Deuteronomy 6, again, huge chapter because this really set up a core concept that has existed to this day in Israel. So moving forward a little bit more in, in chapter 6, verse, 6, verses 10 through 25, this is a good message for today, even in the New Testament church. Beware of prosperity. Being blessed, having prosperity, it is a good thing. But in our human condition, it's, it's also temptation at the same time. And in this, again, this is a sermon style. You know, Moses brings it forth. You know, you can think you accomplished it. You start to forget the Lord is who actually gave this to you. Verse 13, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. This is one of the verses that Jesus quoted to Satan when he was being tempted. Um, verse 16, this is another one. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massah. And then Jesus, or sorry, Moses goes on to explain more Old Testament law. And there, again, there's a lot of details there. This is just high level. Essentially, obey and you will be blessed. And disobey and you will be cursed. Uh, it's a location. So moving forward to the New Testament here regarding the, the law, Jesus fulfilled the law in our place. This is contained in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. There are more scriptures on that, but this is the primary one. And we believe in Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace ye are saved through faith. So Jesus, the Messiah, had not come yet. This is setting up the coming of the Messiah. So going back to the Old Testament law, obey and you will be blessed, disobey and you will be cursed. And then once again, Moses encourages them all, please pass this on to your sons and your sons' sons. Pass them on to all the generations. Do not forget to keep teaching this law. Moving into chapter 7, 
Israel was commanded to conquer. So this wasn't Israel going out trying to do it. Essentially, again, to stress this word, it was their inheritance given to them by God. And they were to be obedient to him. They were to participate in the battle, certainly, but it was God who won the battle. It was God who gave the orders when to attack, where to attack. In verse 1, it is, again, mentioned that Israel was to destroy seven nations from within the promised land. In verse chapter 2 through 3, and also a part of 5, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them, neither shalt thou make marriages with them, and ye shall destroy their altars. This is specifically referring to those seven nations within the promised land. And they were, and they were also stre- and Moses also stressed this: keep your house, land, and relationships free of anything tied with curses. So anything from the people you would have defeated or whatnot, don't be bringing those idols in your house. Any of that concept. So again, house, land, relationships. Keep it free of of curses. Essentially anything idolatrous, anything that's not of God. In chapter 8, Moses moves into warning against pride, specifically. In verse 2, he says, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. And here's the intent, to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keepeth his commandments or no. So the reason is given there. Verse 3, he goes on to say, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, sorry, the mouth of the Lord, doth man live. Jesus himself quoted this verse against Satan. Verse chapter 8, sorry, yeah, verse chapter 8, verse 10 when thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. And this is actually a basis for the Jewish practice of post-meal blessings. Uh, interestingly enough, I actually grew up uh, with grandparents that always prayed before and after a meal, and they never could explain to me why they do that. But you go back far enough, and this is where it comes from, scripturally, the concept. But they weren't able to explain that to me at the time. I always thought it was strange, but there was a reason for it. They just didn't remember why. Verse chapter 8, verse 17, And thou shalt say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. So there's the warning right there in verse 17. So you have these blessings. You have these things. Avoid that trap of thinking, you know, I did this. I can do this again. I've got this. That's, as we see again in Israel's history, it gets you into trouble, that kind of thinking. It really does. Verse 18b, for it is God that giveth thee power to give wealth, to get wealth. It is through God. And that is the the concept that's being spoken by Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Again, he's speaking to the, Jew, the Jewish people, so they understand the Old Testament frames of reference. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Essentially, the outcome of pride, you might be, you know, survive the day, but in the end, you will perish. Pride, you know, pride will destroy you. And there's multiple verses about this. Uh, I chose just a couple here. Uh, Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, he might become puffed up with pride and thus fall under the same judgment as did Satan. And as recorded in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, Satan was thrown from heaven from his pride. So that's a good, th- a good reminder concerning pride. I mean, all sins are bad. All sins are bad. But pride in particular, that was the big one that Satan got called on, was pride. Right, it does. And also depending on him. I mean, he's the source of truth, the source of life. Not Not, not us, right. Moving into chapters 9 and 10, this is where Moses, again, starts to prepare them for the battles ahead. 
and while also recounting some of their past failures. Regarding the battles ahead, God will destroy them. And the phrase used is, he will go before you as a consuming fire. They are reminded of their idolatrous fa uh, failure at Mount Horeb. This is the molten calf. You know, this is where Moses had gone up the mount. He was gone 40 days, and in that period of time, they created the calf. And you know the story from there. And then it also mentions some of their other fail failures, such as at Tabera, and I gave some references here. Tabera, Massah, that's the one location and Kibroth and Kadesh. And those are the references to refer to what happened at each of those locations. In verse chapter 10, verse 2, uh, just kind of as a reminder, you shall put the Ten Commandment tablets in the ark. That's where they were to be put. This is the second set, because of course the first set, Moses had thrown them down, and then they were recreated, and they were to be put into the ark. Correct, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, so the actual container that has the mercy seat on top, they were to be put inside. And so again, it's still believed that they're still there today because there's no mention they were ever taken out. The key emphasis here is verses 12 and 13. And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all of his ways and to love him and to serve thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes. That right there could really be one of the key verses of Deuteronomy. I didn't make it the key verse because you could actually choose like 25 out of Deuteronomy to be the key verse, but that concept is really the theme of Deuteronomy. Chapter 11 moves into the blessings for the obedient. The, uh, you know, the blessed... Is, uh, you get blessing through obedience, this is verse 27, and you get cursing through disobedience, this is in verse 28. One thing I did want to point out here, so again, we're talking Old Testament here, moving forward to today, be extremely careful of people talking about a prosperity gospel. They take it to a completely legalistic level, and it is really a focus on physical blessings for today. And it's really a twist on the scriptures to say that an obedient person will never have hard times because that's where the prosperity gospel will take you. As long as I'm obedient, nothing bad will ever happen to me. And they use these scriptures to try and prove it. Right. And so here in verse 27, it just said, well, if you obey, you'll have blessings. And so people will take just this verse and say, nothing bad will ever happen to me as long as I'm obedient. So it's a twist on the scriptures. You have to read all of the Bible to understand what's really being said here. I've actually run, you know, I'm not super old yet, but I've run into a lot of people that believe in the prosperity gospel. The, and just a little bit from my personal upbringing, I grew up in an area with four churches in it. I'm not even going to mention anything about that, but some conflicting belief systems is my point there. And it doesn't matter which of the churches you were in, there was just this general theme your kid got into a car accident. What'd you do? It was just this assumption you did something wrong. You disobeyed. And so there was this stigma. Families would get a stigma, and it comes back to this concept. If you obey, you have blessings. If you disobey, bad things happen. And so that's why I say, just be really careful about this. Try and help any other people that struggle with this, because they will, they will take these to extreme, and then if we really take this to a literal sense, who's God? We make ourselves God. That's what you're doing. And that's why it doesn't work that way. God is God. We serve him. And yes, we will have blessing. And yes, we will have some times where some bad things happen because we're disobedient. But it's not this literal legalistic approach that is um, trying to be relayed here. In fact, I, don't, I didn't write it down here, but it says many times in the New Testament that we will have persecution and tribulation and distress, and we're to rejoice in it. it right. Yes, it does. It builds character. So chapter 11, um, again, I'm not covering this one as much detail, detail as chapter 6, but chapter 11 is frequently combine, combined with chapter 6 in discussions. Um, because they go together so well, similar concepts. 
Then just a reminder, verses 13 through 21 are part of the Jewish Shema. Chapters 12 through 15 uh, explain in detail how to properly worship. A lot of details there. Part of the worship is going where the Lord sends you. Now, obviously, in the Old Testament, that was very literal. You know, the tabernacle was set up in such a way, the temple was set up in such a way, there was the outer place, there was the inner place, inner place, and then there was the most holy place, and there was all the rules and laws according to that. The worship was very structured. Again, structured by God. But that still applies to us today. Again, not in such a physical sense as this, but it still applies in our daily walk with Him. Correct. The Holy Spirit lives within us. And do you not know that your body is a temple with the Holy Spirit within you? Correct. Right. Verse 12, verse, uh, sorry, chapter 12, verse 12, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God. This concept of rejoice is very important. And it's repeated in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Not conditionally rejoice. Rejoice always. It goes on to mention to respect, respect the blood of sacrifices. And by the word respect, I put that in parentheses, or uh, yeah, parentheses there. Essentially handle both proper blood and improper sacrifices accordingly. Hand them, again, respectfully, meaning according to how they were done. So idols, pagan worship, get that away. If it's, the, again, the blood that was to God, again, handled a very specific way, but ultimately do not eat it. You're not to eat the blood. That is mentioned and repeated multiple times before we get to the end of Deuteronomy. In Old Testament, this was physical. Um, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, Jesus, of course, is at the communion table for the first time, and he said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the many for the remissions of sins. Now, Jesus died on the cross, and he shed his blood once, physically, for everyone. And this is a clear switch from this physical concept in the Old Testament to the, the spiritual impact going forth, because he, he shed his blood once on the cross. And even when he was at the table there, and you know, I'll stress this, um, you know, Catholics would disagree with me, but he did not you know, cut himself open and pour his blood in and say, this is my blood. And he didn't just, I know Catholics want to say that he used, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit to turn the wine into his blood. This is not what the text says. It's very clearly a metaphor of what he was to do on the cross for us. Um, so kind of distressing. This is where the Old Testament, it was physical. New Testament, we move into the spiritual impact through what Jesus did on the cross for us. He did shed his blood for us once for all. Chapter 13, Moses stresses, keep the word of God pure. Have good doctrine. Don't twist it. Don't pervert it. Make sure, and this is, again, through the, the act of teaching and training and passing it on. Make sure that it stays pure. He has warnings against false prophets. And this one in particular, miracles as proof of what I'm talking about. Uh, and also relatives or neighbors who lead people astray. And so here's some, uh, some of the verses for this in the New Testament. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. This, of course, is a future prophecy of the end times. The Antichrist is going to come. He's going to do miracles. He's going to do signs. He's going to do lying wonders. Does that make him right? No, and that's the stress here in the Old Testament. Just because a false prophet, prophet comes up and they say something that's contrary to doctrine, but then they prove it with a miracle or a sign, he's trying to stress, stand on the doctrine. That miracle or sign can still be done of the devil or the enemy or Satan. That doesn't prove that they're right. Because you have to remember, go back to Egypt. They did their miracles and signs, and half of them, the magicians with Pharaoh copied it. It did not make them right. So this is a warning here. Don't use those miracles as proof. Rely on the, the written law of God. Rely on what it says. Matthew 24, verse 24, Jesus himself said, 
For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. They will affect believers. Those signs and wonders will be so awe-inspiring. And to converse with that, so we're talking about false prophets here, right? Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, this is also Jesus speaking. And these signs shall follow them that believe. So we're talking about believers now. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and they shall drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt them, they shall shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So those are miracles, those are signs. But again, the focus of this sermon is don't focus on the signs. Focus on God's word, focus on his law. They have. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, there's a warning to that. Don't add or take away from the word. Chapter 14, the stress moves into the area of, with your life, live it for God. Live it for God, not for the world around you which is essentially going back to the Old Testament. This is what we're talking about. This is what the people are seeing. There's pagan worship everywhere. They came from Egypt where pagan worship was everywhere. So this concept, they've lived with it their whole life. They've grown up with it. They're familiar with it. Don't conform to any of these pagan practices you see around you. You know, the Lord your God has called you to a different way through him. Verse 2, for thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar, and in parentheses, that word peculiar means jewel, treasure, good, or special. So he has chosen you to be a special people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 is very similar. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. Again, a peculiar, in the Greek, that word means purchased or saving people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that concept is still brought forth in the New Testament with us today. Chapters 15, again, this is very high level. There's a lot of information in these two chapters. It's a review of laws already given. Again, very high level, some of them. It talks about the sabbatical year, servants, how to treat them, uh, how to treat the firstborn animals that open the womb. There's another mention of the three major feasts with Passover and unleavened bread uh, clumped together. There's weeks or Pentecost and tabernacles or booths. Those are the three, and all of the men are required to go to that every year. It further goes on to mention appointments of judges and officers and all gates. And at the very end, it mentions no sacred totems, and I say that in quotes, or anything idolatrous. I put those in quotes because, again, at this time, it was a common concept. Everybody knew what that was. So they knew exactly what Moses was talking about. Chapter 17 begins to cover future rulers of Israel. And these are the laws regarding those rulers. Now, already mentioned in the previous chapter were judges and officers, but now it expands upon that a little bit to say, okay, these are your civil leaders. They are subordinate to the uh, Levite priests. They're the religious leaders. So essentially kind of like the Supreme Court over the lower judges. So that is laid out in this chapter. It mentions the witness standard. The standard is given to us by God and is still used today. And that is, it requires two or three. One is not enough. And it goes on to say, and you have to remember, this is Old Testament. They have not even entered the promised land yet. Have not even entered yet. And the Lord prophesies that Israel would have a king. Now this is interesting. The Lord is prophesying it, but he didn't like it. 
In first cha- sorry, in First Samuel chapter eight, verse seven, this is God speaking to Samuel. They have rejected me, Israel, that I, God, should not reign over them. That's his response to their response of give us a king like all of the other nations around us. Now, if you remember, go back to me five minutes speaking in time, what were they not to do? Copy the practices of everybody around them. This was not the model God wanted, but he still prophesied, this is still going to happen, and I'm going to allow it to happen. Because as you've mentioned before, it brings them to a lot of destruction in the end. It wasn't the plan that God had for them, but it was a plan that God did allow for them. Right. In fact, the worst thing you can do is you, you reap what you sow. If you go outside of God's will, that's what you're going to sow. And, it, it, and I didn't want to stress here in chapter 17, it even mentions the motivation. So again, this is a prophecy in the future. And so God tells them hundreds of years in the future, you're going to say this because other nations do it. So he even lists the reason in that prophecy. That's why you're going to say you want to do it. And again, that is quoted. We'll see that when we get to that part in Kings. That's what they said, just like the other nations. That's the reason. Uh, One thing in specific that is mentioned here, kings are actually given a limitation, Israel kings, in their multiplication. And specifically in animals, wives, and wealth. You're not to multiply them. Well, it's kind of interesting because it's like Solomon took this list and said, this is what I'm going to do. Not to pick on Solomon, but he's stressed as being the most exceeding in breaking this rule. David did too. Yes, it wasn't just Solomon, but Solomon like really went all out in breaking these three multiplications. Uh, again, yes, the other kings did it too, and they weren't supposed to. In verse 18, and this is a critical part that, again, so we're talking future king. We're not even there yet. Future king, the kings were to personally, manually copy the law for themselves. Somebody else was not supposed to do it for them. So if you think about that, back in that day and age, if you were manually copying a piece of parchment, what did that make you? A scribe. The kings were actually supposed to be a scribe level of their knowledge of the law. They were supposed to know the law so well they could reproduce it. Kind of didn't happen. But that's the level God called them to. That's where they were supposed to be, as recorded here in Deuteronomy verse 18. And on top of that, after they manually copied this, uh, this, it was to be kept with him at all times. Like like literally on him like a wallet. That, That law was to be with him. And not only to be with him like physically, like kind of an adornment, like intentionally to read it at any moment, any time of any day and Again, intentionally read it. So, to be, a judge, to be a righteous king, to know God's will and law. So kind of like what Moses is doing here in, in all of Deuteronomy, he's reiterating to the people what God's already taught them. That in essence is what the king is supposed to do, reminding the people like Moses what God has already taught them and to keep them on track. Again, over the years, over the times, because we see like at the beginning of Numbers, the very first 14 chapters, they're all obedient and everything's great. Then we get to the middle of numbers and everything goes haywire again. So it's this repetition, repetition, repetition to follow the Lord with all your heart. And the king, of course, was supposed to be a representative of that. And so this is, a, again, a future prophesying of what the king is supposed to be when that happens. All the way back in Deuteronomy. I don't know why, but I keep forgetting that this part is in Deuteronomy. Like, I'm re-reminded of this, that this was initially talked about in Deuteronomy. Well, absolutely. Every day. That's the way I read it. So moving into chapter 18, this covers the laws of priests and prophets. Uh, more of the Levite laws. Again, there's a lot there. Uh, one of the other aspects that's talked about here a little bit more, reject the occult practices that you see around you. And there's a lot of examples given in this particular chapter. One of the big ones was babies being burned. The way the scripture uh, mentions it is your offspring being passed through the fire. But essentially your children, babies. Um, And this was done in Molech, 
worship. Molech was a Canaanite god, and it's really horrible. Um, I think in our first class I mentioned the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. Um, great place to visit. I, again, I still highly recommend it. They actually have a display there um, of the concept. And it was done in two different ways. They would literally just throw the baby alive straight into a roaring fire. And while that's bad, the one that makes my, me gut wrench is they um, would create a, an idol, a, a human-looking idol with the hands held out, and the hands would be cooked to boiling. And they would place that live baby into those hands. It's just with the hands aimed at the fire. So eventually that baby would crumple and would slide off into the just it just gives me chills and it's horrifying that this was a practice a publicly acceptable practice I could, I could see that okay mentioning the three gods at this time again the other two really big ones in this area was Baal and Ashtaroth. Baal represented wealth, and at that time it was agricultural wealth mostly, but wealth in general. And Ashtaroth, quite simply, was fertility, so essentially it was centered around sex and everything to do with it, and primarily public. They, they wanted everybody to see it, and again, the pagan concept, because they believed in multiple gods, was that Baal and Ashtaroth were an item. And whenever life was hard, it meant those two gods were having a bad time. And if people did all their sacrifices, it would encourage them to come together. And in consummating, again, this is all pagan, but they would come together and consummate. And then through the wealth and the fertility aspect, the land would produce again, the animals would produce again. And that's why people burned their babies. They were essentially trying to buy that. It's horrifying. It didn't work. It didn't work. But that, again, was a culturally acceptable concept for the people around them. And so that's why Moses is talking about it here, because they've grown up with that. That's this concept. Abortion. Yes, it's abortion. Yes, that too. But abortion is the big one. It's, it's killing babies. They are alive the minute those... Two combined, they're alive before they come out of the mother. It's, it's this. It's just not doing it with fire. And some of the other concepts here, again, this is high, high level. There's more information here, but most of this is just witchcraft. And witchcraft, at a very high level definition, it is any and all spiritual contact that is not through God. And so a lot of, you know, there's a list that's given in this chapter and there's some other basically subtypes of witchcraft, but essentially it's demonic or sat satanic power. Anything like that is witchcraft. So like if we talk about uh, you know, a Ouija board, palm reading, tarot cards, crystal ball, astrology, all that stuff, it's all witchcraft. There are just different types of witchcraft. You know, the soothsayer is mentioned, that's essentially astrology. And I always get tripped up. There is astrology with an L, and there's astronomy with an N. The N one is actual science. You're just studying the stars and what God made. So don't get tripped up on that. That one's, that one's okay, as long as you're just focusing on the science because you're observing what our Creator made. Astrology with an L is trying to look at all of this physical stuff and predict stuff. And, you know, I've because of this or because you were born in this month or because the moon is over all that kind of stuff that's not that's witchcraft all right and the other one you know that, that i read like the ouija board palm reading tarot cards and reading a physical thing the scripture calls that interpreting omens that's the verbiage used in the scriptures that's what that is verse 15 the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet, capital P in the King James, a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. What I find interesting, and I know I don't have it written down here, it specifically says here, the Lord thy God will raise up thee a prophet from the midst of thy brethren. 
literally says it. There are lots of people, and unfortunately in increasingly numbers, who are trying to say that Jesus wasn't even Israelite. He wasn't even a Jew. And my personal favorite, they, they try and say that like he was a black person from Africa or something. It's, no, he's not. He's a Jew. He's an Israelite. I mean, it's right there. But you'd be surprised how often I run across that. Still, it's completely not biblical. It's not doctrine. It, I mean, it's very plain in more places than just this. I mean, it talks about the full lineage of Jesus twice in multiple places. There's just no question. You know, people still argue it like he's not really Jewish or Israel. He's not. He's not. And he's, yeah, he is. I would, because you're trying to conform God to your image, your standards. Yes, absolutely. And so this verse 15 is all the way back in Deuteronomy. And so again, this, is, this, becomes, this does become ingrained in Israel's Jewish tradition all the way to today. Going back to the New Testament, when Jesus was there, they were looking for this prophet with a capital P. They were actively looking for him. This is repeated in Acts chapter 3 and uh, 7. I'm not going to read them at this time, but I, I wanted the reference there if you wanted to look at it. So this concept of looking for this prophet was actively in their minds at that time. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years from when this was written. And this is why in John chapter 1, verses 21 and 25, John the Baptist is baptizing people. And the Jewish leaders come up and ask this question, are you that prophet we're not asking if you are a prophet. They're asking if you're that prophet. This one in verse 15, are you that prophet? And of course he said no. Jesus confirms who that prophet is. Acts chapter 3, verse 20, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So this is a reference back to he was preached to you. Jesus Christ was preached to you back here in verse uh, 15 in Deuteronomy, and it says in John chapter 5, verse 46, Jesus himself said, for had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for guess what? He wrote of me. So Jesus himself confirmed that what Moses spoke, spoke of him, Jesus Christ. A complete confirmation. So, what's that? Oh, yeah. I, they say there's no one man who could do all that. Well, again, that's the whole point. God did it. He was just obedient. Anything to discredit. All right, so the prophet is confirmed to be Jesus Christ, and this is mentioned all the way back in Deuteronomy. Once again, Moses brings up false prophets, warns them. In Old Testament, if they found any false prophets, confirmed them to be speaking things that were not doctrine, they were ordered to stone them to death. That is what they were, they weren't even to just kick them out. They were to stone them to death, specifically that way. In the New Testament, these are just a couple scriptures. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29, let the prophets speak two or three and let the others judge. Confirm what they're saying. It's not an immediate stoning. Listen to what they have to say and confirm if what they're saying is, tr is true. Correct. He who is without sin can throw the first stone. And so it's interesting you bring that one up. So this is the lady she's brought forth, and they said, We caught her in the act. And we're going to stone her, right? And Jesus writes on the ground, and I'm not even going to go into that because we don't know what he wrote on the ground. But of course he says, he who is without sin, throw the first stone. Well, let's look at the concept there from a law point of view. They caught her in the act. It was a stonable offense. But if they caught her in the act, where's the guy? That means they saw the guy. And guess what? If you saw the guy, you're now a witness, and you let him get off with it, which means you are now in sin because you let the guy off and not the girl because you caught them in the act. They both were to be stoned. And so that's why Jesus saying that was so powerful because by the law, everybody there should have been stoned. 
It was a very, that's why everybody just left. That's why they dropped their Because everybody's like, ooh. Because they were, yeah, they got caught in what they were trying to do. Excellent. Uh, oh, so another New Testament thing regarding fall, um, prophets. First John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. This is something in the New Testament church we have to deal with. It is a reality. You can't ignore them. And we have to always be aware of them. So how do we do that? Primarily, know God's word. Know and, and test it. Know God's word. That, that's the big one. Chapter 19 moves into criminal law what to do with criminals um, who have done something, some sort of criminal, criminal activity. So this, once again, mentions the cities of refuge. And you know, when you first read it, it sounds like anybody who does something bad can just run, you know, run there and hide and they'll be safe forever. That's actually not what's being talked about here. The cities of refuge were actually to protect the innocent so they would have a fair time to prove their innocence. If they were proven to be guilty, it didn't, it didn't save them. Um, why do I have those two chapters? Oh, those two chapters cover more on the cities of refuge. That's why I put them there. Numbers chapter 35 and Joshua chapter 20, uh, a creation of some of those cities of ref refuge. Uh, an interesting one thrown in here, not that it's a bad one, uh, but it mentions do not move ownership landmarks. I don't recall that one being mentioned before. At least I, I would have to search on that one. But essentially, if you have property, if you have land, don't go to the corner post and move it 12 feet so you can get more of their land. That's essentially the concept. This is, this is a law. Don't do that. And once again, there's a mention of false witnesses and the repercussion of being a false witness. What will be done to you if you're not speaking truthfully? Chapter 20 then moves into covering rules of warfare. Now this, of course, they're just about to cross into the promised land, so this is an eminent thing that's coming. These are the rules you're to follow in the warfare that is coming in the coming weeks here. First, first and foremost, trust God, not your own might. Trust God. The Canaanites specifically were to be utterly destroyed. The scriptures say that. There is no quarter. Now others, again, non-Canaanites, they can be spared, but only if they surrender unconditionally and immediately, but not the Canaanites. So even if a Canaanite city did that, God said, no, they're, all the Can uh, Canaanites, they're done. They're gone. Didn't they save some of them, though? Uh, we'll cover more on that. There was one group that tricked them and said, and thought, and said they were from far away when really they were from close by and... They gave them their word that they wouldn't hurt them, but yes, they were of the land of Canaan. So yes, we're going to cover that in Joshua. And then the other thing that was mentioned, which again is important, remember this land is their inheritance given to them from God. Moses tells them here, so while you're doing the warfare, don't wreck the land. This is your land after you win. Don't wreck it. You know, in fact, like, don't cut all the trees down. Uh, you know, when you're siege in the cities with the walls, you know, and battering rams, that sort of thing. Don't destroy all the forests, all the trees. And this, remember, this is your inheritance. All right, where are we at? Chapters 21 through 26. <clears throat> There's a lot here. But this is essentially, for me to cover it, would just be reading it. It's a lot of individual laws uh, ones we've all covered before. So that's pretty much what I'm going to mention. The only thing I did want to point out was uh, chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. And I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to summarize it, that essentially a family member could take a widow. And this was the basis for the marriage of Boaz and Ruth, which, of course, is a very important event in history. So this is where that law was defined. And then that concludes the second sermon that Moses did. The third so th sermon is not as long. The way the text reads, it looks like the sermon was given and then the end, like, 
consecutively goes in time like right away, like within hours or even the same, uh, I'd have to read it again to see if it was like the same day. So it's not like three weeks past, like this sermon's given and it's like, all right, let's get to it. So this is essentially a conclusionary sermon. In chapter 27, it mentions the stones of witness, that concept. And this was a, again, this is initiated by the Lord, a special altar that is intended to be a memorial of Deuteronomy. So what's being spoken about here, record it for people to see. And it was very, you know, so the altar was intended to be used as an altar uh, for sacrifice, but it was to be inscribed with the words of the law. And then, so this is stone. So we're talking painstaking work to do this. This was not just like a scribe writing on parchment. This was stone. And then after inscribed on there, they were to apply like a whitewash treatment to it so that the text was striking. So that, I mean, you could see it very clearly what it said. And again, so that others could see the law. That's what this concept of the stone of witness was. And I must have moved it. But the first one that was done is recorded in Joshua chapter 8 um, when they were doing the blessing and cursings on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Mount Ebal is where the first stone of witness was created. It's recorded in Joshua chapter 8. Uh, they write them down there. And then, of course, this is an event that through Moses, the Lord told the people, this is what I want you to do. And so essentially, it was an open-air worship kind of thing where everybody participated. We are speaking God's law, God's truth, the blessing, the curses from these mountains audibly so everybody can hear it. So again, the whole congregation participated. So the blessings of the law and the cursings of the law. Chapter 28 um, is known in commentaries as the great prophecy for what it contains. This is a critical chapter for proving the divine inspiration of the scriptures. There are many. But this one in particular has a prophecy so far in the future, frankly, by natural means, it is impossible for it to ever to become correct all by itself. You know, no human being thousands of years ago wrote this with such detail that all of it happened, literally without exception. So this is one of the awesome proofs that our Bible is divinely inspired. These prophecies were given to us by God. And and Revelation. That's right. That's right. And so essentially, this is a huge list of blessings and curses. That's how it reads. But these things all happened to Israel over time, all of them in in every detail. And it even covers events that happen during the siege of Jerusalem. Now, of course, it doesn't say the word Jerusalem or or siege or anything like that. But what happens during there, such as cannibalism, eating their own children, that is mentioned here. That's going to happen. All right, so moving into chapter 29, this is a reminder of the covenant between Israel and God. This is a referral back to the blood of the covenant that was 40 years ago in Horeb. It is mentioned God's great works in the wilderness. Remember how he sustained you these 40 years. A reminder that their clothes and sandals did not wear out physically. That is impossible. Of course they would have worn out. I mean, my shoes don't even last three years. And most importantly, you know, these people did not set up shop and, you know, go into their individual trades and do all. They wandered in the wilderness. And so all of their food, manna, was provided for them. God provided all of that for them. So they entirely depended on the Lord during these 40 years. So this is a reminder of that. God sustained you. And the covenant party here was, of course, Israel, a reminder of that. That's who the the party here is in this covenant. Um, Also another reminder, in this day and age, covenants were common and normal. Everybody knew what a covenant was. The very concept of it was part of the culture, even the pagan cultures. Everybody knew what a covenant was. So the party here is Israel. And of course, God is the other side of the party. And it is stressed that not only is it the ones who are present at that covenant, but all descendants. That is stressed. It's not just the ones present, but all descendants as well. Uh, And that's right, I even recorded it here. So in chapter 29, verses 14 and 15, 
neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him who standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. So it's very clear to include future generations in this covenant. After, you know, of course, along with the covenant, um, which is standard practice with any covenant, even if you were to make a covenant today, the promise of judgment that occurs to covenant breakers. Verse 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but these things which are revealed belong unto us, that we may do all the words of this law. And the reason I wanted to point that out is that really ties in with the New Testament copy or concept where it says in the scriptures, but these things are written that you might know that Jesus is the Christ. And I'm paraphrasing. You know, why do we not see more miracles? Why is not more of that stuff written? No, we are told what we need to know. And as it says here, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. If he hasn't told us, then we don't need to know it. Plain and simple, and you really shouldn't worry about it more than that. You know, you can, you can wonder about it, certainly, but don't agonize over something that's, that we don't know scripturally. So, but these things that are revealed unto us, those are what we need to know and do so that we can do what... Yes. That, that concept goes in with what was talked about before. The covenant here was to be with everyone. And this part here in verse 29 is speaking about the God side of the covenant, but it's still, it's still referring to all generations. Yes. Contextually. Forever. Did I spell it wrong? Okay. Well, I admit, I type all these scriptures by hand, so hopefully I didn't miss a word. <laughs> I actually do that on purpose because it helps me mem- uh, memorize them. <laughs> all right, we are almost done here. So, getting to chapter 30, this is Moses wrapping up the third sermon. And these are final warnings that he is giving to the people that he's led for 40 years now. Verse 1. Even before I read this, I'm going to back up just a second. So realize Moses is preparing the people for the promised land. He's told them all this good stuff and bad stuff, but hey, we're going into the promised land. So we're talking about now, now, at the time it was given. So we've got a good, encouraging sermon going right now. Now Moses says this to them. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. To translate that in a a little different way, they're going to be spread to the nations where the Lord hath sent them. So they're currently, again, go back to where they're at. They haven't even got the promised land yet, and Moses just told them, sometime in the future, you're going to be kicked out of your land, and it's because the Lord drove you out of your land. To me, and I'm not judging the situation, but to me, that would be a major downer when in the very next week we're supposed to start taking the promised land and it's just been prophesied we're going to be kicked out of this land after we get it. But again, it's not meant to be a downer. This is meant to show the awesome power and might of God because we'll keep reading. Verses 2 through 5. Um, and this is highly summarized for emphasis, so if you're following along, I'm not reading it word for word, so please you know, read what you have in front of you as well. This is what's going to happen after that verse 1. So we just talked about this horrible diaspora concept, which essentially means they're kicked out of their nation. But this is what's going to happen after that. If you shall return unto the Lord thy God and shall obey his voice, then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and gather thee from all the nations to bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed and multiply thee above thy fathers. So after being to everywhere, he is going to pull you back and he's actually going to multiply you above anything your fathers ever saw. Right? So 
yeah, verse 1 was kind of, kind of a downer, but then we have verses 2 through 5. If they will hearken to him, so it makes it clear verse 1 was because they didn't. If they will hearken to him, he will bring them back. And this is amazing because it specifically says, I will bring them back into the land which their fathers possessed. This is not Israel simply becoming a nation again. This is Israel becoming a nation again in their original land. That has never happened once in recorded earth history with anything, anybody anywhere, ever. It is, based by that definition, it is impossibility, really. No nation on the planet has ever been blown out of wherever they're at, and they come back in the same place. It doesn't happen. But it happened with Israel in 1948. That's major, because if they would have become Israel again somewhere else, that's not this verse. So the fact that it was the original land is what's so critical here. So in May 14th, 1948, Israel was officially declared a nation again in its original land. Now, we're going to get there eventually. We're going to talk about a partial return in Ezra and Nehemiah, but this was only a partial return. It was not a full restore, and it was not everybody to the ends of the earth. Whereas in 1948, they've been pulling people from everywhere, including the United States, to go back to Israel. <coughs> Um, And so then the other thing, Israel now, just in terms of as a nation, we're speaking purely as a nation, it's actually from a, again, from a nation point of view, not spiritually or religiously, from a nation point of view, it's the strongest it's ever been, considering what it stands against today. And it's tiny, it's tiny and fully surrounded by Muslims that want to destroy it. And that's how strong it is to still even be there. And this prophecy that was given to Deuteronomy was approximately 3,400 years before it happened. It's a really long time. When you add up all the dates... That's right. Because they had served the curses of one, they got kicked out of the land because they didn't do what they were supposed It is both a miracle and a complete confirmation of God's word, which, frankly, that is a miracle. God is great, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So verse 6, so we just spoke about two, uh, 2 through 5. That has happened with Israel coming back. Verse 6 has actually not happened yet. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. This is the spiritual aspect of them coming back. Israel might be the strongest it's ever been right now, but the state of Israel today, at this moment, at this second, the majority is secular. The government is secular. That is the state of Israel. So while it's come back, while it's a nation, while they do have a lot of blessing, they have not fulfilled this verse. They are not majority serving God. And there's one other thing I want to stress here with this. They're going to know that when they crucified Jesus, again, they being the Jews, they're going to know that they crucified their Messiah. That is another prophecy that's going to happen. Right now, the Orthodox Jews that are over there, so literally right now, they're serving the Lord, right? They're not accepting that they crucified their Christ. That technically is also idolatry because love the Lord thy God and you crucified him. They're eventually going to realize that. So this verse 6 has not happened in full yet. So this is another thing that's going to be fulfilled. And I think soon, but... It still has to be fulfilled. So it says, uh, da, 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 that thou mayest live. Yes. Verses 11 through 20. Uh, this is where we really get into the conclusion of the sermon. And if you actually just read verses 11 through 20 in chapter 30, 
it reads like a modern day sermon, like in any church you go to where you start getting to the altar call part. This is how it reads. I mean, it sounds like an altar call. And ultimately, right, right in this conclusion, Moses is putting forth a choice in front of the, the, the children of Israel. There's a choice. And he urges them in verse 19 to choose life, choose God, do not choose to disobey. It's not worth it. You know, famous phrase from the New Testament that they don't have at the time, the wages of sin is death. That concept is all through the law. If you disobey, bad things happen. Again, in the law. And another thing to stress, uh, the Switzerland concept. I'm neutral. Well, Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse 23, he that is not with me is against me. There's no neutral. You, uh, no choice is a choice. What's that? And every man is without excuse, exactly. <clears throat> Chapter 31, hold the last words of Moses. Uh, the text, he actually writes it down. He declares that he was 120 years old, literally on that day that, he, um, that it was written down. And it said that he was no longer going to be leading them. I believe the phrase in the King James is there was no more going in and coming out. That phrase actually refers to all of the fighting, all of the military uh, Vice that they did. He's not going to be doing that anymore. And the, the, the text makes it clear the Lord said he wasn't going to be doing that anymore. It wasn't because he was feeble. It was simply because he wasn't doing that anymore by the Lord's command. And then it is reiterated that he was not allowed to enter the promised land. Joshua was now to be in charge. And this is actually repeated seven different times towards Joshua in Deuteronomy and Joshua, this phrase. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous, Joshua 1, nine. That's repeated seven times in a way that it's direct to Joshua. It's actually repeated more than that when you count it just in general, because obviously that still applies to us today too. Uh, but clearly Joshua needed to hear this. Be strong and courageous. <clears throat> and that's not coming down on him. God meets us, all of us, where we're at. And this is what Joshua needed to hear. Um, another thing to stress Joshua was in the tabernacle with Moses. He was the only one allowed in with him. Not even Aaron went in with him. So that's another thing to keep in mind. You know, we might be saying Joshua needed to hear, be strong and courageous, but he was taken into a place where almost nobody else went either other than Moses. And it confirms after this that Moses did write this law down. He was the author. He wrote it down. And then upon its completion, he gave that written book to the Levites, to the priests. And it was to be read publicly every seven years, in full, not in part. So every seven years, Israel, the congregation, was to assemble and to listen to the reciting of the full law. That was to be ongoing forever. That was supposed to happen. And the book specifically was to be displayed beside the Ark of the Covenant as a witness. Now remember, the Ark of the Covenant was in the most holy place. The only person who ever saw that was the high priest once a year. But again, the phrase was, it was there as a witness against the people. Not really to be seen by them, but the object itself was, this is the law, and it's a witness against what you're doing. So that's the concept of that. And then at the end of the, uh, this, Moses was told by the Lord to actually write a prophetic song and teach it to Israel, and the text says he literally wrote it that day, so technically the Lord had to have given him the words and just said, hey, write this down. And then everyone was to gather for the singing of this song. And so the, the mindset that's going on here from Moses' point of view, I think I'm probably jumping ahead of myself, but he had 40 years in Egypt. He had 40 years in Midian. And now he's had 40 years leading the Israelites. It's 120 years. And he has the fortunate or unfortunate, however you want to look at it, I would say fortunate, he knows when he's going to die. The Lord told him, this is what's going to happen. And so that's where his mind's at right now. This song is one of the last things I'm ever going to do. And so the, the mindset of what's going on here, and I'm not saying he's faltering, that's not my point, but the, so, uh, the seriousness and solemnity of what's going on here. 
Chapter 32 contains that final song of Moses, and almost the entire chapter is that song. Uh, the last eight verses, um, it has concluded, and the last eight verses actually are instructions from the Lord and Moses of this is, this is what's going to happen. Moses was to leave that day, so as soon as the song was over that day, Moses was to leave, and he was to walk to Mount Nebo, where he would die like his brother Aaron. And so it's referring to the similar manner. So if you'll remember, Aaron was taken up on a mount in the presence of Israel, and there was a ritual handing over from Aaron to his son Eleazar. Well, here we have Moses going up. It's going to be from Moses to Joshua, and then he's going to um, pass in front of Israel. It's going to be visual. It's going to be seen. That's what's going to happen. So Moses is being told this before it happens. These are your instructions. But here is one thing that was added. Moses is going to be able to see the promised land before he dies. He can't, he can't enter, but he's going to see it. He's going to see it from the top of Mount Nebo. Nebo. In chapter 33, this is, I think this is a cool chapter because Moses blesses the tribes of Israel just like Jacob and his sons in Genesis chapter 49. The similarities are glaring. The same sort of um, blessings there. And I'm not going to cover it in detail here because this could be a whole story, um, discussion in itself, but there are dozens of scriptural fulfillment in the things that Moses speaks over them here. So like these, they're prophetic, a lot of the things spoken here, and what the future is going to hold for that tribe. So we've now reached the end of chapter 33, which is where Moses has concluded his writing. Chapter 34, again, we think is Joshua, but it, we don't know um, because it doesn't say. Chapter 34 is the death of Moses. Uh, it doesn't go into great detail about how it happens. It just, Moses sees the promised land. So he does see that. He gets to appreciate it. And it makes it clear that he was still strong in his body at the time of the death, death at 120. So it's not like he died of old age. The Lord took him. That was the time. And in this case, you know, we have examples of Enoch being translated to God. He physically didn't die. He just went to heaven. We have Elijah who goes to heaven. Moses physically dies. And the reason we know that is because the Lord buries his body. A very unique verse in the Bible. The Lord buried his body. Now, obviously, we can surmise from that. We're surrounded in a culture full of people who worship stuff. Well, this is Moses. So it makes sense that the, the grave of Moses is not to be found. We don't want anybody worshiping his body. We don't, I know this sounds perverse, pulling out a, a femur or a leg bone and worshiping it because that was a thing. And so the, the body of Moses was hid. So it was buried by the Lord and nobody was to know where. And this is kind of more of an FYI. This goes back to the secret things of the Lord. But we're told in June 9, Jude 9 in the New Testament that the archangel Michael contended with Satan over the body of Moses. We have no idea why that happened. We just know that it happened. And it wasn't a battle. It was basically, you know, Michael just spoke the truth to Satan and said, the Lord rebuked thee. It was done. But that's recorded. So that... that is, I would, actually, I would actually love to know um, your reference for that because I, I would like to study that because my research has said that Michael and Satan are actually the same rank. They are both archangels, which is a rank, and so they're actually equal. Now, as far as how they were created, so that would be interesting. Um, so I'm only mentioning this more as trivia because this is a secret thing of God. We don't know why this happened. We just know by this single reference and verse, this happened and it was not allowed. And really you can surmise, it goes back to what I said before, what Satan going to use the body for pagan worship to himself. I mean, he makes some of his followers go find this, go worship it. Hence go worship me. And this is another just piece of trivia. Um, 
scripturally, it doesn't mention any importance here, but, you know, there's no coincidences with God. Elijah was taken to heaven within visual sight of this location. And the reason we know this, it's covered in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. Elijah and Elisha are traveling to the Jordan. You know, they go here, they go here, they go here. He smites the Jordan, and they go across it, and so they're now in the same spot where they were before they were entering the promised land. So again, I'm not saying it was like the literal spot, but it would have visually been within probably three miles, four miles of the same spot where Moses died on the mount when he was looking over the promised land. (coughs) Again, that's just trivia. I'm not trying to take that anywhere. I just found that really interesting because they appear together at the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah. So I find it very interesting that they left the earth in a similar location. I just find it cool. I'm not trying to draw anything with that. I just thought that was interesting. Um, And one thing I definitely wanted to stress here, that at least for myself, and I'm sure for all of you, the epitaph of Moses in 34, verse 5, his title, he was a servant of the Lord. That is how he was referred to. Moses in everything that he did was summarized as a servant of the Lord. He could have had 19 different other titles. And, did they, and they didn't list those other 19 titles. They listed the only title that matters, a servant of the Lord. And then at the end of this, Scripture confirms the very uniqueness of Moses and his walk with the Lord. It says in chapter 34, verse 10, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And I actually already mentioned that part about the verbal communication. But essentially, he was unique in his aspect. Um, Anyway, that is it. That's the conclusion of the Pentateuch. Any questions or other comments?